Heavenly Father, this is your word. Because it is your word, it never returns void. It never fails to accomplish what you want it to accomplish. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It is powerful and effective. It searches us out in the depths of our heart where no one else can see. It moves into spaces other books cannot move. It shows sin like other books cannot show. It's living. It's breathing. It's a divine word. It's a word that works. And we need it to work in us. Because we are stubborn. And we are selfish. And we're obstinate. And we're full of ourselves. And we can see how this word applies to everybody else around us. And not see how it applies to us. Despite our proneness to distraction and despite the coldness of our hearts, please lead us to the empty tomb and leave us there. Give hope. Give perspective. The grave couldn't hold them, and neither could the weight of our sin. Help this resurrection gospel to make us glad, to make us sing, to make us repent. Help us to see that Jesus had to die because we love our sin more than his safety. For the child who has listened to the gospel so many times, but never really heard it once, please give them ears to hear. For the adult who is even at this moment so distracted, settle their minds and help them to hear your word with such clarity that it penetrates the soul. For the hard-hearted non-Christian and the self-deceived non-Christian, use your word like a hammer. Break up the stony heart and make it gospel receptive. For the members of FFC, those who have covenanted together here, help our souls to breathe after holiness, to possess a constant devotedness to thee, Jesus, when temptation presents itself, give us grace to flee to your wounds. Now, great architect, you said, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Build your work and let us not have wasted effort. Never sleeping one, you said, unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Watch over our church, our homes, our children, our marriages, our widows, our teenagers, and protect us. Help us to just get under your word today like little children who want to get under their dad's arm. Meet us in the scriptures and make my feeble efforts fruitful. If this day we are reduced to listening to the meanderings of a mere man... That's a dreadful task indeed. It's a good thing you've spoken. It's a good thing you are a talking God. Will you come now and speak to us? Father, open your hands and feed us. Bend down and whisper to us. Call us to worship. Amen. We preach through books of the Bible at FFC, and on Easter, it is no different. Today is a big day for us because we finished the book of 1 Kings. This is our 20th sermon in the book. Our first sermon in the series was, Who's Got the Kingdom? Then, the transition, followed by, make a wish, any wish. Then, house building, moving day, a building dedication, grand opening, gold and blood, our eighth sermon in the series, the Queen of Sheba, then the peril of drift, one crown becomes two, a divided kingdom, the eleventh sermon in the series, give me that man-made religion, then the mill, the fall, the lion, the crowns are crumbling, a parade of kings. Does your God rule the rain? Stealing bells thunder. The dark night of the soul. 
the God of the hills and the plains. And last week, Naboth's vineyard. Finally, the 20th sermon in our series, from the last chapter of 1 Kings, I bring you three warring kings, 400 flattering prophets, one random arrow. Three warring kings, 400 flattering prophets, one random arrow. If you are pursuing something that you know is sin, but you want to do it anyway, this text is for you. If you have already went against God's word in some area of your life, but still haven't faced any consequences for it yet, this text is for you. If you are facing resistance from family, friends, or foes for standing for God, this text has reinforcements for you. If you are looking for a local church and need to know what to look for in a church, this text tells you. If you are a non-Christian and think that Christians are crazy for actually believing that God judges people, this text speaks to you. If you come to church once a year, to ease your conscience, we will not further that pattern in your life. We will give you the unfiltered word of God. If you were expecting this sermon to last 20 minutes, <laughs> you're in for quite a surprise. May God give you endurance and may he use his word to build your faith. As we work through the text, I will drop truths throughout drip them throughout. But before all of that, you need some background. Israel and Syria were involved in a war. God himself put on the armor and went into battle for Israel. They defeated the Syrians in two different battles. God handed the king of Syria, Ben-Hadad, over to Ahab, the king of Israel. Ahab should have killed Ben-Hadad, but instead he invited him up into his chariot and ended up making a peace treaty with him. Ben-Hadad was on the electric chair, and Ahab pulled the plug. Ben-Hadad was on a high platform with a noose around his neck, and Ahab cut the rope. Ben-Hadad said, I will give you back all the border cities and pay taxes to you. Just don't kill me. Ahab, the king of Israel, agreed, and that's the terms of peace. Here's the problem. God wanted Ahab to kill Ben-Hadad. This was a holy war, and Ahab should have slaughtered him. That whole sequence of events leads to the episodes in our passage. Verse 1. For three years, Syria and Israel continued, notice this word, without, without war. Israel and Syria had been keeping a peace treaty for three years. King Ahab and King Ben-Hadad every December sent one another Christmas cards with a picture of their families in Christmas pajamas. They're going out golfing together, shaking hands when they run into each other at festivals. They actually partnered with 11 other kings in a coalition to war against a larger king. The Bible doesn't mention that war, but history does. So far, not a lot of consequences for disobeying God. However, King Ahab has been waiting three years for Ben-Hadad to restore all the border towns, to make good on his promises, to fully keep the peace pact. Surprise, surprise, Ben-Hadad reneged on his side of the deal. Three years later, and Ben-Hadad still hasn't forked over one of the profitable border cities. A huge trade route ran through that particular city that produced duties and fees, income for the kingdom. Ben-Hadad is still manning that toll booth and collecting all that money. Incense and spice caravans trucked through that city. 
gold and building materials cross that border, King Ahab is growing concerned with the recovery of that city. The border city is between ancient Syria and ancient Israel. It is named Ramoth Gilead. So there's a, a renewal of hostilities. Ahab has been enjoying peace that could not last. Any peace you gain from disobeying God will not last. Any comfort, any advancement, any rest will not last. Verse 2. But in the third year, Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. Now, don't forget, God's people are divided. The united kingdom has turned into the divided kingdom. Israel in the north and Judah in the south. In our first king study, we've been in the north for so long, we've forgotten about the south. Our attention in verse 2 has turned south. What's been going on in the south? Since chapter 15, we have been in the north. For years, the narrator of first kings has focused solely on Israel in the north. Now we are reminded of the southerners. The narrator says, Jehoshaphat came down from Jerusalem. Now, he's not speaking geographically, but topographically. Jerusalem was on a hill, a, a mountaintop. When Jehoshaphat went to Israel, he was headed north geographically, but headed south topographically. Verse 3. And the king of Israel said to his servants, Do you know that Ramoth Gilead belongs to us? And we keep quiet and do not take it out of the hand of the king of Syria? This is quite a funny scene. Jehoshaphat visits Ahab. They are sitting with each other, but Ahab speaks to his servants in the presence of Jehoshaphat. Have you ever heard words spoken to one group, but it's designed for another group to hear? That's what's happening here. He's speaking to his board of leaders, but it's all for Jehoshaphat to hear. He happens to bring up that Ben-Hadad still hasn't given the city he promised. And that city is critical for trade. Ahab wants to tap into that gold mine. If someone promises you a Hong Kong, you want to take possession of it. Ahab says, we've just been sitting on our hands. The ancient Hong Kong belongs to us. And we aren't making any diplomatic plays at it. We are doing nothing. Ahab knows strategically he doesn't have a big enough army to take on the Syrians again. So he's saying this in front of Jehoshaphat, hoping Jehoshaphat will volunteer to help. It's like when you're eating a sandwich and your five-year-old rubs his belly and says, I'm really hungry. He's hoping you will give him a bite. Ahab wants a bite of Jehoshaphat's army. Verse 4. And Ahab said to Jehoshaphat, Will you go with me to battle at Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. Now before this, Israel and Judah had been fighting for 70 years. Suddenly they join hands. They express a willing partnership. They agree to take joint action against a common enemy. My people as your people, my horses as your horses. That's a common way to say joint military agreement. An alliance between the north and the south. If you've been following along in our First King series, you are likely surprised to see that these two are now on the same team. Jehoshaphat is a righteous king, meaning he loves the Lord. Ahab is a rebellious king, meaning he cares nothing for the Lord. Well, what brought these two together? Well, 1 Kings does not tell us, but 2 Kings does. Jehoshaphat's son married Ahab's daughter, 2 Kings 8. They are related by marriage. Jehoshaphat came to visit his son and daughter-in-law and perhaps grandkids. That would make sense. Only a grandchild would convince Jehoshaphat to enter northern Israelite territory. His son married a northern girl. And she stays close to daddy, King Ahab. 
Jehoshaphat should have kept his distance and never allowed his Davidic line to mingle with Ahab. But he didn't train his son to look for a godly woman. They are allied politically, but polar opposites spiritually. It's terrible when the devil's man and God's man make an alliance. Verse 5, And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, Inquire first for the word of the Lord. Jehoshaphat thinks a little more on it and then says, Ahab, you are wasting your time if you haven't inquired of the Lord. Jeho wants to know if this is a holy war. Will God give victory and success like he did in the earlier campaigns against Syria? Will God suit up for battle? It takes more than enthusiasm to win a war. Before Jehoshaphat made a major life decision, he wanted to know what God said. This is his, we need to pray about this first moment. He wants to know what God's will is on every matter. Do you do this? Before a big or small decision, take the time to ask God for guidance. We've now been introduced to the three warring kings. Let's next meet the 400 flattering prophets, verse 6. Then the king of Israel, Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said to them, Shall I go to battle against Ramoth Gilead? Or shall I refrain? And they said, go up, for the Lord will give it into the hand of the king. Ahab snaps his finger and 400 prophets show up. He's got prophets on retainer. He's got all sorts of prophets at his disposal. But these are not Asherah prophets or Baal prophets, rather Yahweh prophets. They consistently use the name for God. And they say, go for it. All the clergy agree. All the pastors are on the same page. Verse 7. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here another prophet of the Lord of whom we may inquire? You see, Jehoshaphat possesses some misgivings about the whole situation. The hair on the back of his neck is starting to stand up. Is there not another prophet we can consult? He's justifiably suspicious. He's wondering if these prophets are simply just wanting to please the king. If they are nothing more than court jesters. He doubts the authenticity of Ahab's clergy. I'd like a second opinion. I mean a 401st opinion. He wants to hear the voice of orthodoxy. He wants to hear from a bona fide prophet. These these 400 prophets, these pastors, are nothing more than fanboys longing for royal favor. An invite to the White House impresses them. They like to post selfies online with politicians by their side. Prayed with King Ahab today. Oh, did you now? Verse 8. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, there is yet one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, Micaiah, the son of Imla. But I hate him, for he never prophesies good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say so. Ahab's a narcissist king who only wants to hear reports that support his agenda. An egotistical man who only surrounds himself with yes men. He verbally and physically destroys anyone who questions his decisions. He only has room for bootlickers who tell him whatever he wants to hear. He loves to hear his own positive thoughts return to himself unaltered. He sought only affirming words, positive words, endorsing words. Nothing they say ever wounds him or cuts him. He has no room for Proverbs 27, 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Ahab continues to operate under the assumption that he is the center of the universe. M Micaiah 
never tells me what I want to hear. He's always raining on my parade. He's doom, doom, doom. Ahab's behavior leads us to this truth. The spiritual health of the person from whom you solicit counsel reveals a lot about your spiritual health. The spiritual health of the person from whom you solicit counsel reveals a lot about your spiritual health. Ahab sought counsel, but only from certain people, not from Micaiah. Ahab did seek counsel from someone who claimed to walk with God. See, we can appease our conscience by saying, well, I asked a Christian if this was wise. You asked someone who claimed to be a Christian. You found a poser that would tell you what you wanted to hear. Someone whom you knew would agree with you. Find a Micaiah. Are you avoiding asking someone about your job because you know what they will say? Are you avoiding asking someone about the person you are dating? Are you avoiding asking someone about how you are spending your money? I'm not laying out my budget before him. I know what he would tell me. Are you avoiding asking someone about your time, your anxiety, your parenting, your grandparenting, because you know what they will say? Are you avoiding asking someone about your commitment to the local church? Do you have people speaking into your life who will keep you tethered to God's word? I'm wondering if you know someone who holds to the truth faithfully. And that's why you keep them at arm's length. Jehoshaphat overrules the objections of Ahab. He's diplomatic but determined. Ahab, don't be silly. Let, let's, let's just ask Micaiah. Ahab's response reveals his attitude toward the word of God. Ahab did not have a listening heart. He was not receptive to God's word. He's always questioning it. He loves darkness rather than light. His attitude toward Micaiah gives a glimpse of his heart towards God's word. His refusal to hear the word of the Lord only further damns him. See, the human heart and mind are not neutral to what is true. There were hearts that hated the truth back then, and there are hearts that hate the truth now. Ahab hated bad news. Friend, it, it is better to hear one painful truth from God's mouth than a thousand cheerful lies from affirming mouths. Ahab became mad at the deliverer of God's word. <laughs> I can't stand Micaiah. He's just so brash. He's always against me. Here's a local church application. Find a pastor who will tell you what you need to hear and not what you want to hear. Find a pastor who will tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. He never says anything good about me. There's nothing good to say about you. I don't like his demeanor. I don't like his personality. Why did Ahab hate Micaiah? Because he told him the truth. Micaiah's allegiance to the living God was not superficial. This wasn't a religious hobby for him to be picked up and put down. His devotion went past office hours. The desire in you to always be affirmed is not from God. The craving in you to be flattered is satanic. Micaiah's lot in this passage reminds us of our lot in life. If you tell people the truth, you will eventually be the recipient of hate. 
If you tell people the truth, you will eventually be the recipient of hate. Ahab says with gritted teeth and a blood-red, angry face, I hate him. The best compliment that could ever be paid to Micaiah was, I hate him. Hated for the master. If everyone loves you online, why is that? Socrates once asked, what did I do wrong that yonder villain praised me just now? If so-and-so speaks well of you, if an Ahab applauds you, that's a problem. Because he has not the theology to praise what is good. What did Jesus say? If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. You, like Micaiah and Jesus, must have the right enemies. Verse 9. Then the king of Israel summoned an officer and said, Bring quickly Micaiah, the son of Imla. Let's stop there. The narrator deliberately slows the narrative here to build tension. As we wait Micaiah's arrival, another prophet steps forth. During the interlude, he steps on the stage, verse 10. Now the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, were sitting on their thrones, arrayed in their robes at the threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Samaria. And all the prophets were prophesying before them. This meeting is moved to a suitable site, the city gates. It could accommodate large gatherings. These two kings, Ahab and Jehoshaphat, sit resplendent in front of the crowd, arrayed in their glorious robes, decked out in their kingly regalia, the city gates were a place of judgment. The threshing floor at the city gate is an image of judgment. You find city meetings at these places all throughout your Bible. Think of it like a, a fairgrounds, a state fairgrounds, used mainly once a year for harvest, but, but a big open area. They are staging a prophecy performance. Verse 11, the prophecy performance begins. And Zedekiah the son of Canaanah, made for himself horns of iron and says, Thus says the Lord, With these you shall push the Syrians until they are destroyed. And all the prophets prophesied so and said, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and triumph. The Lord will give it into the hand of the king. We discover here a graphic description of the prophet's antics. He's very theatrical. He puts horns on his head and moves around like a bull. He's saying Israel will gore the Syrians like a bull gores a rodeo clown. He brought object lessons. It's entertaining. He got the crowd going. These kings certainly receive this message with warm approval. These two iron horns, Zedekiah didn't manufacture them on the spot. He brought them from home. Now, I want to point out that he's preaching the Bible. He's preaching Deuteronomy 33, 17. The bull with his horn shall gore the people of Ephraim and Manasseh. He's simply preaching Moses, reenacting a Moses passage. He can't be wrong, Kyle. He's only applying that old biblical text to a fresh situation. Beloved, the mere quoting of Scripture does not guarantee the right application. There is more heresy preached in application than in interpretation. It sounds so close to the truth, it looks like it applies here, but it doesn't. It didn't honor the author's intent. This man used Deuteronomy 17 for his own advancement, his own purposes, his own agenda. The fraternity of Zedekiah is alive and well today. The fraternity of Zedekiah is alive and well today. Every time a passage is invoked to accomplish someone's agenda, every time the original author's intent is ignored, 
That's Zedekiah preaching. Peddling their lies and muting God's word. Hijacking a passage to make it say what it is not truly saying. They want a photo op. They adapt their message to be popular with the elite. They posture for the masses. They preach messages that get them invited into the corridors of power. It's easy to identify false prophets on Mount Carmel. They were calling out to Baal. It's harder at the gate of Samaria. They are calling out in the name of Yahweh, using God's name, saying positive things about God. They are wolves cleverly disguised in sheep's clothing. Prophesying pleasantries. Prophesying pleasantries. God has great things for you, Ahab. Ahab, you know what God wants for you? Anything you want for you. Here's a slip out of God's promise box. Deuteronomy 17. Ahab liked these preachers. I want someone who makes me feel good about myself. Who tells me that great things are ahead for me. Church, there aren't just Zedekiahs in the pulpit. There are also Zedekiahs in the pews. There aren't just Zedekiahs in the pulpit. There are also Zedekiahs in the pews. Have you ever been summoned to the audience of the king? Felt the subtle pressure to muffle the truth of God's word? In front of certain audiences, you cower with your family at Thanksgiving, at a workplace training. You hear suddenly, let your words be favorable. You decide not to run the risk of displeasing them. Zedekiah saw the political forces lining up and he just jumped in line. Are you going to jump in line when the political and the social and the cultural forces are all on the same page? Verse 13. And the messengers who went to summon Micaiah said to him, Behold, the words of the prophets with one accord are favorable to the king. Let your word be like the word of one of them and speak favorably. Finally, the messenger arrives to Micaiah and says, The king requests your services. He wants to go to war with Syria and take back Ramath Gilead. He's asking Yahweh prophets what the Lord says. If this will be a holy war. Micaiah, uh, let me put a little bug in your ear. Let me kick the tires with you. 400 prophets have already said, go for it. You are the last prophet to be consulted. Make it a unanimous vote. This needs to be 400 and 1, not 400 to 1. Don't rock the boat. Tow the party line. Mind your tongue. Don't worry. Everybody else is doing it. Verse 14. But Micaiah said, As the Lord lives, what the Lord says to me, that I will speak. He's a man who would not tailor his message. I am going to tell it like it is. I'm not a bootlicker. I will remain faithful to God's word even if it's me against the world. This is a model of courage and faithfulness. He must speak and so must we. One faithful prophet against 400 false prophets. Beloved, everyone may be pushing you to see the light. Look, you're the only one not caving to this. You're the only one who says this isn't right. Do you not see that, that Ahab's got a, another good king on his side? Jehoshaphat. He, he's a true follower. A true Yahweh follower supports him. Micaiah, just throw your support to Ahab. You're the only one not seeing the light. But you can't intimidate Micaiah. 
You can't make him ignore God's word. Here's the pressure. Everyone is saying, this is a work of God. Who are you to say that it's not? Look at them all lining up. How can 400 prophets be wrong? Beloved, just because they are all agreeing doesn't mean they are all telling the truth. We live in a democracy where majority rules, and that tends to bleed into our view of truth. When it comes to truth, majority doesn't rule. God rules. Theocracy rules, not democracy. When Micaiah stands for truth, there is no surge that turned the tide. Half of the 400 false prophets didn't join him. He stood alone. The overwhelming prophetic majority sided for military action. If you stand for the truth, if you stand for God, be prepared to be outnumbered. Be prepared to stand against all those who dominate the educational system, all those who dominate the music industry, all those who dominate the technology industry the higher educational elites, the college profs, be prepared to be a lone voice. Micaiah stood alone. Or did he? You never stand alone when you stand with God. Ahab will ask Micaiah's counsel, but only because he is pressed to do so. Verse 15. And when he had come to the king, the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle or shall we refrain? And he answered him, this is quite surprising, go up and triumph. The Lord will give it into the hand of the king. When asked his opinion of the potential invasion, Micaiah said, sure, Ahab, go ahead. Name it and claim it, king. The land is yours. God wants you to win. He wants you to win at everything. Micaiah is sarcastically mimicking the 400 prophets. This is sarcasm. You can hear it in his voice. It's irony. He meant just the reverse of what he said. He's mocking Ahab's attempts to enlist Yahweh to support his political agenda. This is a classic example of trying to get God in on what we are doing. Verse 16. But the king said to him, How many times shall I make you swear, Micaiah, that you speak to me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? (laughs) How many times have I made you promise to tell me nothing but the truth? Apparently, this is not the first time they've had a conversation like this. Apparently, this is not the first time Micaiah has thrown some sarcasm Ahab's way. Verse 17, And Micaiah said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let each return to his home in peace. This is a devastating prophecy. He says, I asked God about your little war, and he gave me a vision, a vision of sheep scattering because the shepherd was killed. Shepherding was the task of a righteous king. All Israel here refers to the fighting forces of Israel. You will leave them by themselves on a mountain because you will die. Verse 18, And the king of Israel, Ahab, said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell you that he would not prophesy good concerning me, but evil? (laughs) He looks at him. Didn't I tell you this man hates me? All Ahab is concerned about is how the message makes him feel. Ahab is the forerunner of every leader who says, tell me the truth, but expects only affirmation and rejects all criticism. Do you want the truth or not? That's how we escape the truth. We complain about how it was delivered and dismiss it because it wasn't gentle. Well, he told me in a harsh way. Well, she wasn't gentle enough with me. He's so short with me. Micaiah just pushes God's word into my life in a condemning way. 
It makes me feel bad. Micaiah then interrupts Ahab while he's all caught up in his feelings. And he says, I'm not done yet, Ahab. Listen to God's word. Verse 19. Then Micaiah said, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the host of heaven standing beside him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab, that he may go up and fall at Ramath Gilead? And one said one thing, and another said another. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord, saying, I will entice him. Micaiah sees a vision. The curtain of heaven opened for a brief moment to reveal God's heavenly throne and Ahab's feet. Ahab, as you sit on your temporary throne, you are wise to listen to the one sitting on an eternal throne. This passage may startle our Western imaginations and unsettle our puny theological minds, but God will bring Ahab down through enticement. He will put on a prize ruse. This scene is like a war council. Picture a war room that is making plans on how to defeat Ahab in battle. Verse 22. And the Lord said to him, by what means? And he said, I will go out and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, you are to entice him and you shall succeed. Go out and do so. Who is this lying spirit that will give Ahab false confidence? Some people believe it's a fallen angel, demons. It, it could be. I don't think demons are granted access into God's throne room. I, I think this is a holy angel. This bold angel steps out and says, I will get the majority to believe a lie. Have you ever wondered why the majority believes a lie? I will get them to embrace a false hope. God's angel filled these puppet prophets with seductive lies. The lies lure Ahab to the execution God has ordained for him. This lying spirit accomplishing God's work is puzzling to us. God is not the author of deceit, but he is sovereign over false prophets. God is not lying, but he is making use of liars. He turns their effort to carry out his judgment. Unknowingly, these 400 prophets are agents of God's judgment. God gave them a lie to love and a truth to resist. If you refuse to listen to God's word, you will be given to false lies. Now there is mystery here. We must worship in the mystery. The war room is showing God is sovereign over error and sovereign over bringing Ahab down. Does God commission an angel to lie, to, to, to trick, to bear false witness? Look at verse 23. Now therefore behold, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these your prophets. The Lord has declared disaster for you. God clearly tells Ahab of the enticement, the lying spirit. So how can that be deception? It's garnered, it's garnered a great deal of scholarly discussion. The troubling aspects become less troubling when we realize God is clear. He is very transparent. I'm laying a snare for you, Ahab, and I'm not hiding it. There's ultimately no deception here. Ahab is told clearly. It's completely telegraphed. They lure Ahab to his death. Then they tell him, you're being lured to your death. The angel set a trap for him. And then he shows him the trap. Verse 24. Then Zedekiah, the son of Kainana, came near and struck Micaiah on the cheek and said, How did the Spirit of the Lord go from me to speak to you? Now, I would rather be hit in the face than slapped in the face. Some of you have been wondering, now you know. <laughs> I'd rather be hit in the face than slapped in the face. There's something just so disrespectful about being slapped in the face. 
this rival prophet, Zedekiah, walks right up to Micaiah after he speaks and strikes him on the cheek, slaps his face. You are not influenced by the Spirit of God. False prophets are very concerned about hurting the feelings of the Spirit of God. They always feel the need to defend the Holy Spirit. I think he can defend himself. Did you notice that the ones talking about the Spirit of God aren't hearing from the Spirit of God? This pseudo-prophet claims to have a message from the Spirit. Well, God is telling me this, so he can't be telling you that. Another voice joins the chorus of prophets condemning Micaiah. Verse 25. And Micaiah said, Behold, you shall see on that day when you go in the inner chamber to hide yourself. Micaiah, his face is red. He retorts, Zedekiah, the day is coming when you will hide yourself in terror. In other words, you will face fear and disgrace for being disproved when your prophecy fails. When Ahab dies in battle and the sheep scatter. Verse 26. And the king of Israel said, seize Micaiah and take him back to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son. And say, thus says the king, put this fellow in prison and feed him meager rations of bread and water until I come in peace. The king orders, lock him up. Ahab is oppressing the truth. He's persecuting the truth proclaimer. Micaiah is locked up in the slammer. He's God's man, whether he's slapped in the face or thrown in jail or jeered by the majority. It's one thing to make a commitment. It's another thing to stick with it in the moment of confrontation. Micaiah planned the stand and he took the stand. And it leads us to this. Stand firm in an ungodly culture. Does anybody mistake you for a Micaiah? Every Christian is called to follow the path of Micaiah because the path of Micaiah is the path of Christ. If no one dislikes you on account of Christ, it is likely because you have been too quiet about Jesus, too lukewarm concerning him, or too much like the world for anyone to notice the difference. If we bear authentic witness to Jesus Christ and his commands, if we bear authentic witness to Jesus Christ and his commands for long enough, we are going to face pushback. Sometimes it will get you slapped, sometimes crucified, sometimes it will limit your influence, sometimes it will limit the growth of your business, sometimes it will cause family to disown you. Are you a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb? And shall you fear to own his cause or blush to speak his name? Must you be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas? Are there no foes for you to face? Must you not stern the flood? Stem the flood. Is this vile world a friend to grace to help you on to God? Friend, you must possess some confrontational Christ-likeness. Some confrontational Christ-likeness. Be the one who refuses to flatter the ungodly. Many Western Christians are afraid to offend and I'm telling you, it's a Western thing. We are in an age where everyone is hypersensitive to hard words, allergic to bluntness. You never need to be embarrassed by the candor of God's word. Whether it is on the issue of homosexuality, or transgenderism, or abortion, or sex before marriage, or the exclusivity of Christ, he's the only way to God. 
the exclusivity of Christ or the reality of hell? Does your zeal for God and his house consume you? You, like Micaiah, will face the choice between being faithful and being popular. The choice between being ostracized and being accepted. Pagans parade their profanities and perversities before our ears and eyes without restraint. But it is ours, apparently, to keep quiet and let them perish out of politeness? No. Christ-likeness is not niceness. Possess some confrontational Christ-likeness. Don't expect people to kiss you on the cheek when you proclaim the faithful words of God. Verse 28. And Micaiah said, if you return in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. <laughs> this is Micaiah's appeal to verification in the future. If you live, Ahab, God didn't speak to me. When you die on the battlefield, remember I told you it would happen. True prophets had this boldness. They didn't have unfulfilled prophecies. Micaiah willingly submits himself to the prophetic test. Well, we will see what happens. We'll see how it turns out. There was not a little prophetic test tube where you could dip his words to see if they were true. It didn't turn blue if it was true and red if it was false. Verse 29. And the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, went up to Ramath Gilead. Let's pause there. Both kings dismissed the sober warnings of the man of God. This is not a holy war. God isn't suiting up and entering the battle with them. But they go anyway. Ahab predictably listens to Zedekiah. Jehoshaphat, surprisingly, doesn't listen to Micaiah. Why did Jehoshaphat go along with this after he heard the prophecy? I'm not sure. It's one thing to ask for God's will in a matter, and it's another thing to submit to God's will in that matter. You can pray about it first and still make the wrong decision. Plus, I mean, they're family now. They're related by marriage. Family can convince you to sin. It's my daughter. I want her to see that I am supportive. It's my son. Nothing is thicker than blood. Not even the gospel? Jehoshaphat. Well, what do you want me to do? Not see my grandkids anymore? I have to ma maintain a good relationship with the other grandpa. Jehoshaphat is a surprise. Ahab is not. Ahab brazenly expects to return safely from the battle, to ignore God's word and come out in safety. This is the king's misplaced confidence. He's going his own way despite regular warnings. He's delusional. Sin makes us delusional. He's set in his ways. He will pursue this path no matter who tells him it ends in hell. Verse 30. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and go into battle. But you, <laughs> wear your robes. And the king of Israel disguised himself and went into battle. Ahab chose to disregard the oracle, but not to ignore it completely. He must secretly fear Micaiah was telling the truth, because the more he thought about it, he said, I can't go to battle wearing my robe and crown. He's the king, but will not dress like the king. Kingly garb would leave him highly visible. It would put a target on his back. He takes precautions to outsmart providence. That's the point of the disguise. He thought he could escape God. And the other grandpa, King Jehoshaphat, I mean, how do you not see you're being tricked? Hey, friend, let me tape this bullseye on your back. Hey, Jeho, King Ben-Hadad is coming to kill me. He's got spotters everywhere looking for someone in, in kingly attire. Will you just put this Ahab mask on and let's go to battle? Jehoshaphat is slightly naive. 
idealistic and warm-hearted toward Ahab. And he misses all of this. He didn't have the discernment to understand when someone was manipulating him. He loved God, but was easily manipulated. Verse 31. Now the king of Syria had commanded the 32 captains of his chariots, fight with neither small nor great, but only with the king of Israel. King Ben-Hadad said, look, I want you to ignore the small fry and go for the jugular. Cut off the head of the snake. And, And I think it's quite mean of him. I mean, Ahab unplugged the electric chair when you were about to get electrocuted. He, he cut the noose when you were about to be hung, and this is how you repay him. Well, Ahab's cunning plan worked to perfection because of verse 32. And when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat, they said, It is surely the king of Israel. So they turned to fight against him. And Jehoshaphat cried out. And when the captains of the chariots saw that it was not the king of Israel, they turned back from pursuing him. The only properly attired king drew the attention of the warriors. They pursue, he cries out, I'm not King Ahab. They back off realizing they have the wrong man. They withdrew, now looking for the camouflaged king. Three warring kings, 400 flattering prophets, now one random arrow, verse 34. But a certain man drew his bow at random. And struck the king of Israel between the scale armor and the breastplate. Therefore he said to the driver of his chariot, Turn around and carry me out of the battle, for I am wounded. I don't want you to miss this, okay? Someone shot an arrow randomly at a battalion of Israelite soldiers. It was such a coincidence, a lucky shot... There there was one place where there was a little gap between the pieces of armor, a chink in the armor. The mathematical probability was really low. Just a minuscule gap in the protective gear. But King Ahab knows his wound is serious. Get me off the firing line. They rush him away in a chariot. The kingly chariot. And it leads us to this truth. You can't hide from God's arrow of judgment. You can't hide from God's arrow of judgment. It always hits its target. Ahab's death was sudden, but divinely timed. He controls random arrows flying through the air. The arrow flies unerringly to its divinely ordained target. He is the God of providence. He is the God of decrees. In the history books, it was listed as accidental. In God's book, it was listed as providential. Not randomly, sovereignly. This is the first guided missile. The arrow of God's word always finds its mark. The arrow of divine judgment always always finds its target. God's providence guided the flight of the arrow. Providence. Providence. God willing it to happen in the way that it happens before it happens. Every gust of wind that day, every imperfection in the shaft, the fluffiness of the feathers, all determined by the God of the arrow. Non-Christian, you will never escape God's judgment by hiding from it or running from it or camouflaging against it. You can only escape God's judgment in Jesus Christ. I want that to land on you, non-Christians. You are never going to escape God's judgment by hiding from it or running from it or camouflaging against it. You can only escape God's judgment in Jesus Christ. God's patience will come to an end. The 400 prophets who affirm you in your sin may not like it. You may not like it. But the message of the gospel is this. You have offended a holy and righteous God. 
Your, your sins deserve rightfully the wrath of God. Jesus Christ came to bear the wrath for all those who would bow before him as Lord. Repenting and believing on Jesus Christ alone saves a sinner, a sinner from the ultimate arrow of judgment, a place called hell. Run to Christ, dear friend. There is no other escape from your sins. Ahab believed in God, but wouldn't repent. Your head knowledge belief that doesn't affect your life is not enough. It's not. Verse 35, And the battle continued that day, and the king was propped up in the chariot facing the Syrians until evening, until at evening he died. And the blood of the wound flowed into the bottom of the chariot. He's mortally wounded. He thinks about Micaiah's words over and over again and again. It took him nearly the entire day to finally die. The wheels of justice turn slowly, but they do turn. The, the Lord's deception of Ahab has succeeded. Ahab's attempted deception of the Lord has failed. Verse 36, And about sunset a cry went out through the army, every man to his city, every man to his country. Israel's army is now leaderless, and they scatter home like sheep without a shepherd. They abandon the ship because the king is dead. Micaiah's prophecy fulfilled to a T. Verse 37, So the king died and was brought to Samaria, and they buried the king in Samaria. Put on display here is the sovereignty and the irony of God's judgment. Ahab, he called Ben-Hadad into his chariot to make the deal, and he ended up dying in a chariot. The place of his sin was the place of his death. He failed to carry out the implications of the holy war, so he died in an unholy war. Verse 38. This is, this is pleasant. Children, cover your ears. And they washed the chariot by the pool of Samaria, and the dogs licked up his blood. And the prostitutes washed themselves in it, according to the word of the Lord that he had spoken. The driver washed the chariot by the pool of Samaria. No car washes in that day. In that day. You, you, you had to go to the water source. So while he's washing the chariot, wild dogs licked the dripping blood and male and free, female prostitutes washed in the blood of the king. Ahab's death was foretold by three different prophets. An unnamed prophet in chapter 20, Elijah in chapter 21, and here Micaiah in chapter 22. God's triple prediction. When Elijah predicted it, he said, the dogs will lap up your blood. The Lord's sentence executed. It's no doubt that Yahweh has orchestrated these events. Ahab's life ends the way it began, ignoring prophecy. I'd imagine Zedekiah is now looking for a place to hide. His prophecy has failed, and he is somewhere running with his horns on in terror. Now, we've got some divine scraps at the end, verses 41 through 53. They seem to be just leftovers, not connected to the story. Pretty stock, in, pretty stock language for condensing the life of a king to a few verses. King Ahab and King Jehoshaphat, we find a summary of their spiritual walk, their military exploits, their political achievements, and their royal successors. It, it, it says... Now the rest of the acts of Ahab and all that he did. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat and all that he did. We find out in those verses Ahab is a complex and inconsistent man whose reign is uniformly bad. Jehoshaphat is a simple and gullible man whose reign is uniformly good. One king engaged in cult prostitutes, another king rid the land of them. One king who repents... Another king who will not. As we say goodbye to the book of Kings, two quick applications. The first application is this. Jesus is the full and final king, the greater Ahab. Jesus is the full and final king, 
the greater Ahab. The point, all right, here's, here's, here's the problem with, with taking a long time going through a book. You can, you can go through a book, and when you get to the end, you, f- you forget what's the emphasis of the book. Here's the emphasis of the book. The point of the book, book of Kings is for you to desire the king. All these kings point to this one. They were deficient. He is divine. Unlike Ahab, Jesus would never leave his sheep without a shepherd. Ahab is a bad shepherd. Jesus is a good shepherd. Ahab put his people in prison and gave them bread and water. Jesus put his people in a church and gave them bread and wine. Ahab died in a chariot. Jesus died on a cross. Ahab died for his own sins. Jesus died for the sins of the elect. Ahab was buried and his body rotted. Jesus was buried and his body resurrected. God took a crown off one king, Ahab, and God placed a crown on another king, Jesus. Ahab took off his kingly garb to hide from soldiers. Jesus took off his kingly garb to die for soldiers and sinners. Jesus is the full and final king, the greater Ahab. Jesus is the true and better prophet, the greater Micaiah. Micaiah was not the last time a truth-telling prophet will be seized. 2,000 years later, they will seize another. His name, Jesus Christ. With Micaiah, they struck him on the face. With Jesus, they struck him on the face. Micaiah insisted on only saying what his father had given him. Jesus insisted on only saying what his father had given him. Micaiah was accused of being a false prophet and then wrongly imprisoned. Jesus was accused of being a false prophet and then wrongly imprisoned. Same story, but one main difference. Micaiah was merely a man. Jesus is the God-man. Micaiah came to tell the truth. Jesus is the truth. Father, strengthen our resolve to stand for you. We know that your words of hope must be as solid as your words of judgment. Your glory word must be as sure as your gory word. We do not, like Ahab, expect to ignore your word and come out in safety. No, our safety is found in Christ, the perfect king and the perfect prophet, the only one who kept your word perfectly. Amen.